Here we go. Biggs, welcome back. What's up, Vlad? Hey, man. First and foremost, before we get into anything else, great movie with OG. Oh, yeah. Thank you, man. Great movie. I got to watch it on HBO. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm already... I'm already a fan, you know, of the main, you know, of the star. Yeah, Jeffrey Wright. Yeah, Jeffrey Wright's dope. I mean, super from, dope. Uh, you know, I, I know he's been in other movies, but I remember him in Boardwalk Empire first. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, as far my earliest remember uh, memory was Shaft when he played Peoples. Yeah, yeah. I, I miss Shaft. I, I didn't watch it because I remember in the comments everyone was talking about Shaft. Yeah. So and it, so he plays a. Uh, a Spanish character, right? I don't know, Dominican, Puerto Rican, what have you. And I thought he was. I don't know if you remember, like, first seeing Scarface. Like, back in the days, I thought Al Pacino was Cuban, right? <laughs> Until he was like, no, Al Pacino, he's really, you know. Uh, and that's what I got from him until I seen him in his second movie. And then I remember going back to see Basquiat. Um, so, you know, Westworld and... He played in a couple, like two of the James Bond uh, movies too, right? Quantum of Solace and something else. And he's yeah, dope. I, mean, he's, I think he's yeah, one of yeah. the best actors of our time. I agree. And I looked him up. He's won some Golden Globes and some mm -hmm. Emmys. Yeah. Uh, no Oscars yet. 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 But uh, yeah, no. I remember when I when I first started watching uh, Boardwalk Empire. I'm like, who is this guy? Like, this guy's like stealing the show right here. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and he played a gangster in that in that movie, you know, in that series as well. I think what was so interesting about OG was that it was actually filmed inside of a maximum security prison. Yeah. And the prisoners were actually extras in the yeah. movie. Yeah, 150 of the cast members uh, were actually uh, inmates. And so was the co-star, right? So can you imagine him getting best actor and the best supporting actor as an inmate? That would be Wait, a first. The dude with the dreadlocks was an inmate. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I did not. I did not know that. Yeah. What was the uh, What was he serving time for? I'm not sure what the crimes were, uh, but I believe he's in for maybe thirty plus. So all those guys, uh, those main characters, all have uh, thirty plus years in in, in prison. Been yeah, sentenced. Exactly. Been sentenced to yeah. I guess he won't be attending the Oscars if he wins then. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Um, that's crazy, though. Like, I had no idea. I just assumed, like, I remember, uh, I mean, th th there was a scene on the basketball court where he started, like, arguing with this one dude, mm -hmm. you know, like the older dude. And I'm like, okay, that guy looks like an inmate. Yeah. You know, but I didn't think the actual co-star was yeah. an inmate. Was the, yeah. Wow. Was there any... Is there any difficulty in actually working with the inmates as you're filming this? Uh, no. Well, uh, the, the jail Pendleton in Indiana, I mean, the warden, you know, was very cooperative. So he gave full access. So things worked out. It was probably more pressure on Jeffrey Wright to play an inmate alongside inmates, right? So that's the challenge there that he accepted. And he said it was really tough. Um, but, I mean, I, he pulled it off and it looked so natural. But that's one of the things that showed me how great he was. Yeah, man. That, that one scene where, uh, you know, the the sister of the victim yeah. uh, confronted him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was very kind of sort of multidimensional because he was like, you know, he was sorry he did it. But he was like, well, you know, the other guy had a gun, too. So. You know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. a very clear-cut situation yeah. that he was trying to kind of get through. Yeah, but that's that's all a part of the restorative process, right? One, accepting responsibility, knowing what you've been through, but at the same time, you have to go through that. These guys are going back into the community. So, you know, you got to equalize the plane where it's about the victim and it's about the victim, you know, the person who committed the crime, because you got to relieve that burden and go through the rehabilitation process because you don't want the same cycle once these guys get in, back in the community happening again. We already have a 70% recidivism rate and then 50% chance that your kid goes to prison if the parent did. So it's it's been, you know, this same cycle of people coming out, going in, coming out, going in, and it's affecting our communities the most. 
Yeah, man. I feel like like prisons don't really rehabilitate like they're supposed to be doing, you know, on paper. Yeah, they focus on punishment, not the rehabilitation process. So this is the dialogue that we hoping to start from this movie. And it was tough because this movie was more of a drama. It would, you know, a lot of people see it and see these things and they want action. They want a, a tons of fights and things like that that goes on. So we was hoping to tell a story through this uh, through this process that was a little different, but still kept you, um, you know, wanting to see what's next and, and keeping the viewers interested. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, there was what maybe one fight, one little half-ass fight. Yeah. <laughs> you know, basically yeah. in, in the whole film, and it wasn't based on that. There wasn't any like killing. You know, this was not American Me. Basically. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. This was not one of these like, you know super graphic prison type type films it was really more of a thoughtful film yeah which other you know films focus on and the focus here one was a little different which is something that attracted me to it because it was done in an artful way that told a story that can hopefully do something that will create some change and you were the executive producer on this film correct okay and, and well, why two, did you actually right? that and it's a hard truth ain't it which is also on hbo right the, the documentary that goes along. yeah with the film. So so why did you get involved in this project? Um, it was brought to me and they wanted to see if it was something that made sense and it was something that I could amplify and bring stuff bring something to, especially because I'm all about reform and social justice. Okay. And I mean you've done you've done films before. Yeah. Um I mean there's there's streets streets is watching, of course. Yeah, that kind of yeah. That was our first uh, dip in the, into the water, but after that it was uh, what Paper Soldiers, Death of the Dynasty, Streets. I mean, uh, State Properties. Then obviously we graduated and did things like Paid in Full, The Woodsman, and um, Shadow Boxer. Yeah, Paid in Full was my favorite out of that whole bunch. Yeah, that that uh, that's like an all time. It is a cult classic. classic. Yeah, I mean, I, and I got to interview Az Faisan. Okay. You know who the who the Ace character uh-huh. uh, was based off of. Um, you know, he kind of felt a certain type of way as being portrayed as a snitch at the end of the film. And when you when you look at the you know the the final product of Paid in Full, are you happy with it? Good movie. Don't get me wrong; it's a classic. Good movie, man. Excellent cast. Everybody played their role to perfection. Cameron did a good role playing out, but Wood Harris did a good played a good role playing me. Yeah. Lulu, good role, good movie, man. But at the end of the film, why do you make it look like I was wearing a wire and told on Alpha? Which that that never happened. Never happened, bro. So here I present a film to them, trap to try to save a generation. Like, wake up, man. Why do y'all destroy my character to the streets that who I'm trying to talk to to make it look like I was a snitch so that they can't hear the message? Because who want to listen to a snitch? Yeah. And I actually interviewed Wood Harris <laughs> after yeah. that and, <laughs> and talked to, talk to him about that. And he goes, well, you know, once you write a script and sell it, it kind of leaves your control. I interviewed uh, Az Faisan. Um, he said, "Now, I, I guess even though it was his story, mm-hmm. he kind of once he sold the story and it started to go into production, he kind of lost control of." That's how it goes. Having you know? to say, "Yeah, that's how it goes." You know, he would be rare if he didn't. He's yeah. the writer. Yeah. So they don't deal with writers after you know. Or nothing, unless they're a writer producer, you're, right. you're not going to have much to say. So, at that point, you know, whatever happens to the film is what happens to the film. But it was, uh, yeah, man, like, I feel like whenever someone gets shot, the first thing they do is put up that camera on meme. Like, the, you know, dudes get shot every day, B. Like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, classic day, lines in there, yeah, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, but that, I mean, the movie, and even for me, it, it has a special place because uh, my brother Bob was in the scene, right? That classic scene where he talked about the, uh, you know, I got a dollar for every bump on your face, a um, hundred thousand or whatever it was. Uh, but to see my brother in that scene, it, it, it's always like a, um, it's a happy and sad moment, you know. 
Yeah. No, and, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that uh, a little bit later. But um, congrats, man. Like, everyone, you know, people are really saying that this movie's a classic. Like, I've, I've seen those types of comments because, you know, I posted on all my social media, you know, uh, the night it came out. And uh, people are like, yo, this is, this is a classic right here. You know, yeah. so congrats on your involvement in that. Well, thank you. And, and I guess the the director is the granddaughter of the inventor of Oxycontin? Yeah, I found that out uh, after, the, uh, after the movie, after the Tribeca film uh, premiere. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting sort of, you know, tying into the whole story, man. It's definitely, uh, yeah, man, very dope project. Congrats on your yeah. involvement in it, man. Yeah, shout out to her. I'm happy that this is something that she's pas passionate about because she's been fighting for this uh, quite a bit. And even the marketing of the movie and, and making sure that the right message gets out, that it's about the film, you know, and it's about the message and what's going on. You yourself had a fairly hard upbringing. Um, I guess your dad actually was on drugs. Yeah. What was that like growing up in that type of environment? Um, you don't think about it as a kid. It just, you know, you see things and things are around you. Um, it's when you get older and you're more knowledgeable, it gets a little tougher. And then when you get even past that, you, you look at your life and, you know, you see things that may make you angry. You may have some regrets there. Um, but I was real vocal about it to talk to kids to say, look, I've been through what you've been through or might be going through. And, um, you know, and I can understand and just try to help them, giving them a message of, of hope. You know, there is a rehabilitation process that they could get through that. Um, but at the same time, I, I can understand the pain as well. Yeah, man, I, I've, I have uh, people close to me that grew up with drug addict parents. Mm. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a tough thing, man. And, you know, the people I know, they actually use that experience not to do drugs. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But they actually said, okay, this is, here's a blueprint of what, of a path not to go down. Exactly. And, and, you know, and so forth. And, um, you know, I guess when you were three years old, he gave you a dog named Cocaine? Yeah. So you could see where my life was going, right? <laughs> That's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. You were evicted at age 10 from, well, I guess you and your mother were evicted uh, when yeah, you were 10 Yeah, well, my family, my, it was my brother, my sister, and myself, and I live with both parents. Yeah, okay. so, oh, so, so your dad was still in the family, even though yeah, he was Yeah, yeah, my father was, it was, I would say fairly present. He lived with us. You know, he wasn't home every night, but, you know, that's, that's where he lived. And, yeah, so for maybe two years, lived with family, friends, uh, all around New York, uh, Bronx, Queens, and things like that. So we settled with my aunt, uh, who boyfriend stabbed her over 20 times and and then um, lit the house on fire to commit suicide. And after that, we moved into a shelter. Okay. So so you get evicted when you're 10. You move in with, with your aunt. Yeah, and her probably boyfriend. about eight years old, but yeah, around that age, yeah. Okay. So did your aunt get killed? She she did live. Um as far, oh. So she was a Jehovah Witness, and miraculously she lived because they don't take blood transfusions, which she needed. Hmm. You know, so she refused to do that, and we thought that she didn't have a chance, but yeah, she did live. Okay. As, were you actually moved, pre she, she had were you movement, present? She moved in a shelter with us, so her, her two kids, and then there was five of us, so it was a total of seven of us living in the shelter at that time. When the stabbing occurred, did you were you actually there? Yeah, I was on the uh, stoop playing cards with my cousin oh, and my God. sister, and my cousin ran out saying that he stabbed her. And my brother Bob was in the house, and luckily the smoke woke him up. Ooh, I mean, how badly did, did that affect you, like going through that particular experience? Um, from there, like me, my brother Bob, and my sister, we were split up. I ended up moving in for that summer with one of my other brothers. And it's funny because at this time, I don't remember where they moved. You know, the family was uh, just split. But again, at eight, nine years old, you don't, you know, you know what's going on. You know, you're there. But I don't think it had any type of an effect on me. You know, 
I was still a kid, you know, and didn't really understand what was going on. You just staying with different people, staying on floors and in beds and rooms and going to school and still trying to just enjoy life. Sad, man. I mean, you know, now that you have kids, you know, I'm sure you appreciate how much they don't have to go through anything like that. Yeah, because I sheltered my son from that environment and that place and, you know, try to give him the best schooling, you know, which he went to private school and things like that. And, 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 and you know, and luckily, even after everything that I, I went through, he's doing really good. He's in college, just got his uh, associate's degree the other day. He's going for his bachelor's now. Um, you know, uh, all A's. He's doing really good in, in college. So I'm, I'm probably happy about the direction he's going. He's actually in Paris right now. Yeah, I mean, that's the dream. You know, the, the dream is to not have your kids go through the same fuck shit that you went through. Yeah. So I guess after after leaving the shelter, you know, you, you told yourself that you're never going to go through, you know, that level of poverty again. So at 13 years old, you, saw, you started uh, selling drugs. Yeah, 13 years old. Yeah. Fell victim okay. to the streets. Yeah. Okay. Did your parents know about that at that age? No. No idea. Okay. And when you talk about, you know, that game, it comes with a lot of losses. So what were the worst things you were going through as a teenager doing that? Um, I don't know if it was, you know, there was situations that happened around me. Uh, but that involved other people that I don't, you know, particularly would like to speak on, you know, because those are other people's situ situations and circumstances. But, um, you know, there's really two things that happen. You either go to prison, get shot, go to jail, something like, you know, I mean, get killed. There's not a lot of options when you're, when you're living that life. Right. Did you realize that early on? No. Okay. Because you were just getting money at that point. Yeah. You know, you just think about getting yourself out of circumstance, but not really the repercussion of it until something happens. Was there a point when you said, OK, I've got some money now. And I'm now starting to understand as I'm seeing friends around me go to jail, get shot, get robbed, whatever else that like, OK, I need to really go into a different direction or else. I, I think anybody who lives that life doesn't do it to do something long term. You, you do it with the hope of getting out and doing something different. So it's not um, something you like, oh, yeah, I'm gonna spend the next 20 years doing, you know, doing this or whatever it may have you. Uh, you know, you do that to try to get out of a certain circumstance. Right. And Rockefeller ended up being that, that circumstance. Uh, no, we threw parties. We did things um, even prior to, you know, launching Rockefeller. So I had, you know, learned some type of business acumen from from that. And even with the, uh, uh, you know, with the parties and things like that. So which was early on with Rockefeller that kind of brought the lifestyle to it. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever asked you why the name Rockefeller. Tone Hooker came up with that name. That was prior to me even um, being a part of anything musically. Okay. I mean, because I assume it's based on, you know, John D. Rockefeller. It was. And then when you battle somebody, you rock a fella. So it was like a double entendre. Well, one thing I've never also asked you, I mean, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to, to your number one, but if you were to rate your top five Jay-Z albums, how would you rate them? How would you rank them? I don't know if I have a particular order, but, you know... I know Reasonable Doubt, American Gangster, would be in there. Okay, so Reasonable Doubt would be number one? Either that or American. It's, it's, right now, American Gangster, I've been living with that, you know, a lot. So huh. it's, it's definitely easy. Maybe there's a 1A and 1B. Hmm. I, I, don't, I don't see people putting American Gangster as their favorite Jay-Z album. This is the first time I've actually heard that. Okay. Well, this is me, right? Not yeah. people. Well, yeah, and, that, and that's <laughs> yeah. why that's why this is so interesting. Because I mean, you're the most you're the most involved. I know. What is I'm it just saying this is this is what speaks to me, right? So okay, those two okay. Uh, blueprint, uh, black album. What's the fifth one? Oh, maybe four, four, four at this point. 
Okay. So his best-selling album, which was Hard Knock Life 2, would not be in your top five. Uh, right now, no. But, you know, because he's... It's not about what sells the most. You know what I'm saying? That's probably the biggest one commercially. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, I'll put Reasonable Doubt number one. Yeah, and that's the one that sold the least, so, right? D did that sell the least out of all his albums? Yeah. To, to this day? Uh-huh. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, okay. All right. I mean, it was a very different music industry back then. No, but that's my point is it doesn't matter about the sales, right? It's whatever. It's, it's your personal preference. You and your older brother, uh, Bob, uh, a.k.a. Bobalob? Yeah, Bobalob, yeah. Um, at one point, he ends up getting killed. Uh, I guess in the Bronx? Yeah. To this day, do you have any idea the story behind that? No. Nope. Describe to me the moment that you got that phone call. Um, I got the, probably a little after midnight, his, uh, my nephew's birthday was the night before. So it was, we were just celebrating a birthday, I think we're at Benny Hanna's. And then um, said he was going out and then my sister called and uh, said the, the, you know, the police came to her door and told her that he was killed, shot uh, nine times. So yeah, to this day, we still don't know what happened, what it was, that was back in 2003. So, you know, still a painful thing, especially for the family, myself. No, I mean, especially you're talking about nine times. That that's a personal, that's a personal situation for someone to risk, you know, getting caught, you know, by shooting someone that many times. That that was something something obviously very personal between the two of them. And and the fact that the person never got caught, how how badly did that eat you up? Um, I mean, you can imagine for anybody, right, going through that and wanting to see justice. Uh, so I, w um, I know you're talking about me specifically, but I mean, it's a painful thing for my family as well, right? So I'm really sensitive even when I go through that, you know, I talk about it, but I gotta remember, you know, these platforms and who's listening and who's talking and who's it reaching and coming back to, right? So I've spoke about it a lot, um, over over the years, right? And Jay talked about it in the song in depth, but still I gotta be real cognizant of their feelings as well. No, absolutely. Because at the time that it happened, Jay was working on the Black Album, right? Yeah. Okay. And then he ended up talking about that situation on Lucifer. Yes, correct. And you actually had no idea that that verse was even being put together. No. How was that? When you, when you come in the room, and they play that song for you, and suddenly Jay is talking about, you know, I got dreams of holding a nine milli to Bob's killer. It's still a painful thing. Um, and I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I can appreciate it now that, you know, my brother got his name in a song that tends to live on forever. And I even use it as motivation now. You know, whether I'm working out, whether I'm listening to something, whether I'm in a place where it feels like my back is to the wall, um, I can listen to that and know that I can move through and get through anything because that's who my brother was. He was the person that would always push you to go to that next level. So I, I find I find it as a positive now. Yeah, I mean, I guess when they, when they played you that, when they were playing the album, they played that song last because they were kind of nervous about, about playing that for you. And uh, yeah, like, like you said at the time, it, it kind of fucked you up even listening to it. Yeah. So... You're, you're sitting, you know, you have this situation that, you know, your brother gets killed and you have absolutely no idea who did it. But, you know, me and you, when, when we were at the party, you and I had this conversation, you did reach a, a level of, clo you know, self-closure when I guess you got locked up, right? Yeah, and I had to come, you know, and actually say the words that I will forgive the person without seeing them, right? So forgiveness... I think it isn't just about words, it's a feeling as well, you know what I'm saying, and really letting, letting that go. Because it, I spent nine years without looking at a picture of my brother, because it was that painful. So I had to come, you know, after I got saved and 
really say, you know, look, you know, there's a forgiveness and just prayed for whoever that was that, you know, that put us through that circumstance and for whoever that is as well. So you truly forgive that person? If that person came in the room right now and said, I don't said, know hey, what I would do. Yeah. No. What was it in prison that made you find Jesus? Um, I don't know if I found him. I think he found me. Explain. I went through, uh, you know, after speaking to somebody um, about a business plan and they chose to talk to me about the Lord. In about six hours, we, you know, went through, uh, talked about Bible, talked about scripture, talked about, um, you know, we fellowship, talked about real life situations, things we've been through, gone through. And then that night, uh, things changed for me. And um, I, I couldn't stop thinking about the Lord. And I came back and told them about that. And then we started to have more conversations about it. And then I, I get, you know, I was all in after that. I mean, were you religious at all before then? I was an atheist. Okay. I'm an atheist. Hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I guess I've never, I've never gone through this level of awakening that you're, you're really describing. So, so even as a kid, did you go I to mean, church and all? Atheist, or? I mean, you still have faith, right? Yeah, I have faith. Yeah, but I'm saying, so you have to have faith that this isn't real, <laughs> right? It isn't? No, Explain. I'm just saying, right? If you're atheist and you don't believe in something, you have to have faith that it isn't real, right? So it's either you have faith in something is real or you have faith that it's not. It's just funny, like when you think about it, it still beco you know, becomes faith-based even on both sides of that coin. So you're saying that I have faith in what I see around me or that you don't to... believe in, right? Because you have to have enough faith that, you know, especially in Christianity, they talk about, you know, if you don't have faith, you may not make it right to the afterlife, whatever. So you have to have faith that that's not true, that that's not going to happen. Uh -huh. Or even with, um, you know, Buddhists, uh, you know, uh, Muslims or whatever it is, right? What was it about Christianity that, that drew you, you know, because Seems like a lot of people become Muslims in prison. But but you chose Christianity. What was it about Christianity that really? Like I said, I didn't chose it. it I feel like it chose me. Yeah. It chose you. Yeah. Got it. So now you go to church on a regular basis and so forth? I have yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's a schedule, but it's not about church. Recently, Dame Dash put out a video where he apologized to you. Can you say what what he was apologizing for? I'm not sure. No idea? No. I mean, were you guys maintaining a relationship since the, the Rockefeller breakup? Yeah, I just seen him probably a month before that video came out. Okay. So when that video came out, how did you feel? Um, I mean, somebody showed it to me. I was just like, I'm, you know, I seen it. I mean, I didn't feel any way. It didn't make me feel differently about Dame. That's my brother. I love him. Okay. Did you call him afterwards and ask what it was about? No. You know, you talked about how after the after the Rockefeller breakup, the one thing. Let me make sure that I get this right. Um, the one one of the regrets that you have after the Rockefeller breakup was that it dissolved the business relationship with Kanye? Well, I was saying that uh, we could have been in the Kanye business if we would assign them to a different label, which we had the opportunity to. But um, we didn't think that they was, as, they was just going to do the same thing that we was going through with Universal, so we just chose to keep them there. Okay. Did you still maintain your relationship with Kanye to this day? Uh, the last time I seen him was at the Louis Vuitton thing in uh, in Paris when Virgil first got there. But um, I mean, yeah, we still have a, definitely have a relationship. We've seen each other, said we love each other, and then that was you know basically it. It was it was a lot of people there, and we was it wasn't about us at that time. We were celebrating the moment, you know, with Virgil being a part of history. So we was happy for for that. Yeah, I mean, what Virgil has done is is really on a on a different level like like I saw some sort of report that said that that off-white is the 
the biggest luxury, like the most prominent luxury brand in the world right now? Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you're talking about Louis Vuitton as well, like 200 years old or, or something of that sort, like a lot of these luxury, you know, Gucci is probably, what, 80, 90 years old? Like for, for you know, a relatively young young guy to have a brand that's got that level of impact is really nothing like I've seen in my lifetime. Yeah, that's dope, man. Shout out to Virgil. Shout out to Kirby, uh, Pierre Moss, Harold Preston, you know, all these, um, you know, up and coming uh, black designers that's really doing their thing right now. Yeah, I mean, the fact that he he was able to Head join state, Louis Tau Vuitton. Feet. Like there's some guys that I, you know, that I always root for, Jerry, you know, Lorenzo, Fear God. Yeah, well, the fact that he was actually able to, to join Louis Vuitton as what the creative director for men's. Yeah. While Emery, still paper maintaining. Planes. Shout out to my brother Emery. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the fact that he's still able to maintain his own company and still do stuff with Nike, like whoever hooked that deal up is, is really. I mean, everybody. <laughs> I mean, that's not nothing new, really. I mean, if you look at designers and spaces, they've been doing that for years. Yeah. But I mean, you see like a Mark Jacobs, who was the creative director of Louis Vuitton. And he had his own brand, but the brand was under the Louis Vuitton umbrella. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that was Mark Jacobs. Yeah. Yeah, you got a whole new, a whole new uh, wave of of business people these days. Yeah, that are just just flipping the whole game. Um, I mean, when you look at some of the stuff that Kanye has done since you guys, you know, have parted ways, like, you know, the support of Trump, the you know, the slavery is a choice comments and so so forth like that. How do you feel about that? Um, I mean, some stuff that Kanye does, I, I don't agree with. I haven't had a chance to speak to him to understand where he's coming from. So I don't really like to comment on that until I can hear the other side. Um, but obviously, publicly, public facing things that come out, you know, it, it looks it definitely looks a certain way. But I like to, you know, kind of have a conversation, understand what he's going through, what he meant by some of the things instead of just looking at sound bites. Yeah, yeah, man. Well, we're going to see what happens in, a, in 2020 in the election to see if Trump still stays around or not. There was supposed to be a Rockefeller documentary. Whatever happened to that? Uh, I mean, we didn't, we never said we started shooting that. That was something that, something that eventually I want to put together. Okay. So it has, hasn't actually started yet? No. I mean, that, that might be the biggest documentary ever <laughs> once yeah, it, could it actually be. comes together. Have you guys ever actually thought about doing uh, like a scripted? No, nobody's really thought about it. That's something that I, I thought about doing. But I'm at this point, you know, with my new media company, I'm pretty busy and I have a lot of things on the slate right now. So I'm just focusing on that right now until, you know, certain projects come back to the uh, forefront. OK. And, you know, you sent me a link to, to your new media company, to the partnership that you guys did. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I just launched Bolo Media, which actually pays homage to my brother, Bob. So I took the B.O. and the L.O. from my mother that passed, too. Her name was Lorraine and created Bolo Media. And it's a partnership with Valiance Media. So um, developing new projects, looking to acquire projects, TV, film, short form, long form content. OK. But OG is not under that umbrella. No, OG was done prior to. It was done prior to. OK. Um, has anything actually started with that partnership yet? Are there any? Yeah, yeah, we have like, lots in, in development right now and stuff that's in production. Okay. Yeah, so. Dope. It's, yeah, uh, it's probably a little premature to talk about those projects now because I'll probably come back on once those are coming out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about I mean, it publicly. It's dope. You know, like, like I always say, it, it's easy, you know, like, like when you talk about music, anyone can get a hit. A hit record is something that anyone could do, regardless of skill level or talent. Uh, I would, uh, I wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say that. I don't know anyone. If anyone get a hit, it would be that much easier to have a hit. No, but <laughs> you, you've seen a lot of one-hit wonders over the years with people that were not all that talented. Like William Hung from American Idol <laughs> had a hit song with like him doing covers of you know with, with a bad accent. 
You see what I'm saying? Like you, you yeah, see I'm people. I'm not familiar with it, but I'm just saying hit. Still, hit songs aren't 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 easy. Right, but what I'm saying yeah. is, but you've seen lots of people that could do one. I hit I mean, song. you can have you can have a, a hot single doesn't guarantee you a long career. I would say well, that, and that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like a person could have a hot single even if they're not extremely talented. But you know, to see someone continue to do dope projects over and over again in different genres, that to me is the, is the impressive part. It, it seems like in Rockefeller, you were the guy that was kind of thinking outside the box with other projects that wasn't just totally focused on music. Was that accurate? Yeah, but not just me. I think as a collective, we all did. There was just some things that I was passionate about that I brought to the table that, you know, some of the companies we were able to form, obviously like Armadale and Block Savvy, like, you know, jumping into tech, uh, the sporting agency with, you know, Rockefeller Sports that we had early on. Fashion was probably thought of prior to, you know, even before Rockefeller. So I wouldn't say that's something that I um, that I came up to, you know, up with rather, but several businesses during the Rockefeller time, um, I probably brought to the forefront. But you know, it was a collective effort. I don't like to say bigs, 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 bigs. It's, it was a trifecta, and everybody had their hand in something. And whether I did it or thought about it, they can take credit for it the same way. If they did something, thought about it, I can take credit for it too. One is under, once once is under that Rockefeller umbrella. It's 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 and it's not just about me, Jay Dame. That's Tata, Emery, Beehive. You know all the staff that help us get there as well. So, you know it's everybody could raise their flag and anytime we did something because it's not just us, right? It's a team effort. With Rock Nation, uh, Emery and, and Tata went, you know, and joined Jay at Rock Nation, but you yourself did not. Well, was there a reason for that? I wouldn't say they went and joined themselves. I mean, they built another company. So we, we sold the company and everybody went off and, and, and built what they wanted to do by themselves. Okay. But, but you yourself were not part of Rock Nation like that. I'm not a part of Rock Nation. I've never been a part of Rock Nation. Right. That's what I'm saying. No. But, I do but everything there, by what? myself. Damon does his businesses by himself and Jay does his businesses by himself. Okay. Almost just but, like the PayPal Mafia when they broke up, they all created different businesses on their own. Right. But you're still very close to everybody over there. Like I see you, you and Emery taking pictures all the time and hanging out and so forth. Yeah. Well, uh, even, you know, when you got 10 and 12 and 20 friends, there's also there's always people that kind of click up and hang out out, out of those, you know, out of that collective. So me and Emery was always close from, you know, 20 years ago and just maintain that same relationship. So even if it was me, Jay, and Dame, and we were out somewhere, me and Emery would probably be going off someplace in the club by ourselves. You know, that's just how it was. Yeah, man. Well, listen, it's extremely impressive, man. Like, like what you guys started on your own, you know, and, and as an entrepreneur myself, uh, like, I understand the intrinsic difference between building up an infrastructure an, an infrastructure yourself and you know management and office space and and so forth as opposed to someone who just joins a big company and gets a check it's a very very different beast so i have the utmost respect for what you've done before and what you continue to do decade after decade right yeah thank you absolutely